Good morning and thank you for joining us here for a live Q&A. This week's Q&A is going to be beginner beekeeping. So it's all about asking those questions that you might feel a bit afraid of to ask. Unfortunately, there is a bit of a, a scene out there where people are sometimes treated uh, not the best when they're just learning and asking questions. But here, ask anything you like and that's okay. We all started off as new beekeepers once, so it's really not a problem to ask any ridiculous question and we will answer those live on camera. So what I'm doing here is just having a look in the window of this flow hive and I can see there's some nice capped honey, which is beautiful, which means the bees have done their amazing work collecting the nectar, reducing it down, creating their honey and now they're just closing the capping in. You can see there's still a few cells open with glinting nectar in them as they top them up with the final bits and make sure the moisture content is down below that 20% range. They'll then wax over the top like a preserving jar to say that honey is going to, to keep and we'll keep that for later. Lucky for us, they store more than they need often and we can share some too. So what we're going to do is have a look at the rear window view as well and identify a frame to harvest. Now this is a bit of an interesting view because we can tell a lot about what's going on in the hive and we can see that some of these frames are looking nice and, and capped. And when I say capped I mean they've put their wax capping over the top and they've filled all of the cells up and some of them are looking not quite full yet. So you can see there the um, there's a few cells missing and over here it's nice and full. And interestingly enough, there's this, um, the bees have been putting their propolis, which they, they block all the gaps around the hive and make sure it's airtight. And uh, you can scrape that off, it'll be nice and resiny. You can even chew on that um, stuff if you've got a bit of a cold or something. The propolis is a great uh, medicine, really. It gets used a lot in medicine. So what I'm going to do is I've just used this window cover as a shelf and I'm going to get a, a tube here and, and let's go for this frame because it's looking, looking nice. Um, it is a bit of a patchy time of year so they may have eaten some of the honey out from in the, uh, in the middle but it should be, should be fairly full and capped enough for us to harvest. So the tube goes in and then we get a nice big jar this time. You can harvest with small jars or big jars depending on what you want to do at the time just by moving this shelf up and down on these screws here. So beginner beekeeping Q&A today so put those questions in the comments below and we'll get to answering those. No such thing as a silly question and if you have so the answer to somebody else's question, by all means chime in. That's what it's all about. It's just about helping each other, sharing the knowledge. It's up to us as more experienced beekeepers to pass the knowledge down to the new beekeepers. And that's the way we've all learned and that's the way we'll pass it on down the chain and make sure our bees are getting looked after. So what I'm going to do is put this key in here and then turn it. And what you should see is honey starting to flow down and out of the hive here and it's already starting. You can see it coming down the tube. I'm going to put the key in and turn it again. Uh, it's quite easy today. Sometimes it's really hard to turn the key and sometimes it's quite easy. There you go. So the, the honey's pouring out of the tube and into the jar. It's a really hot day so it's moving quite quickly today. Ah, interesting. I thought it was going to be the paper bark but it's not. So I'm just trying to recognize that flavor. It's just a beautiful, sweet honey flavor. I'm not getting strong tones showing that it's any particular type of nectar. Uh, sometimes you can really connect the, the flower to the taste of the honey just by simply smelling the flowers and connecting that scent with the, the taste of the honey. Look at that, it's absolutely pouring out. It's a hot, sweaty day here in the southern hemisphere uh, and the honey is flowing. Any questions? Yes, Cedar, um, lots of people tuning in today and my God, how amazing is that honey that's pouring out of there? It's so beautiful. 
Um, Cedar, we've got a question from Chris just saying, what's the best hive to start with if you're a beginner? So a setup like this is, is the best, I think. It's, this is our Flow Hive 2 Plus, and it's got all the features that we've included to make things easier for you. Number one is the, the frames. It saves that whole palaver of extracting in the conventional method. When we were inventing this, we went, hang on, how can, how can we're pulling apart the hive and taking all the frames and annoying the bees and uh, taking them back to a processing shed and going through that long, sticky, messy hard work that extracting in conventional is. And we um, came up with this design where we can turn a handle and the honey flows directly into the jar. Made it sound easy, but it did take 10 years of work to do. Um, so across all our flow hives, we have these frames that that's the number one feature. But then this flow hive too has extra features like down here, we've got the ant guards and then these sturdy uh, cast aluminium legs that are adjustable on each corner. We've got levels built into the side to help you set it up. We didn't even check that before we went going. You can see here we could tilt it back slightly further so that bubbles in the middle. There's also one at the back. We've got a pest management tray under here. And uh, it is a bit confusing for people because we still sell the classic we we started with and people still love that model as well but the flow hive 2 and flow hive 2 plus has these extra features um, including more windows and and brass details and so on great and Cedar, what about other equipment for beginner beekeepers what what do you advise that they should get okay so you will need a bee suit and sometimes when you're harvesting honey especially if you're just beginning good idea to wear your bee suit just uh, as you you can see there's a few bees um, buzzing around and they might start to get uh, a, little, a little aggressive depending on the genetics in your hive. So you, you bee suit and you'll need them for your brood inspections as well. And then we have a, a smoker and that comes with a tool for manipulating the frames as well. And gloves, so bee suit, gloves, smoker and hive is, is all you need to get going and then you'll need to uh, choose your favourite finish and you'll need to get your bees locally to add to your hive and get them started. Look after them and they'll grow. We also have a, an online learning course at thebeekeeper.org if you really want to sink your teeth deep into, from square one right through to a deep scientific knowledge of, of beekeeping. So, that's been getting really great feedback there if, you, if you're the type of person who wants to really get into the knowledge and do a lot of learning. Fantastic. And Cedar, a few people just asking what finish, um, this is obviously the Western Red Cedar 6 frame Flow Hive 2, um, what finish has been put on that hive and how come we paint our roofs? Okay, we paint the roofs because that's the, that's, gets the most, uh, I guess, wear and tear from the elements. The sun beats down on it, the dirt falls on it and the the uh, paint actually lessens the way it expands and contracts as well. So it provides a better weather seal. You might need to do, do a few good coats and, and also get it in all of the cracks and things in order to get a good weather seal on top. Then on the, the body, we tend to just paint the outside and leave the inside perfectly natural for the bees. Now this is a decking coat. This one's got a stain in it. I prefer it when it's a clear coat because you get all the natural tones of the Western Red Cedar if you've chosen that, that wood. But deck coats do last longer. So anything um, that's made for decking, then it's made for really outdoors, highly durable uh, a finish. So they're the ones we tend to tell people to use because they'll get a longer lasting finish that way. You can oil them, but the oils will dry out pretty quickly and you have to reapply every six months or so. And you can also paint them. You can see a nice hive down here. If you've got the Aracaria, then we recommend a good house paint on it. If you try to try to do a decking coat, you might be disappointed with a lot of mildew. Your uh, paints get artistic and, and paint that one and that will provide a really long finish if you've chosen a good outdoor house paint. Fan. Mm. 
I think we just, I oh know we're good. Um, Cedar, uh, Rose is asking, and I think maybe talking about the brood box, can you harvest the kept honeycomb from it? In the brood box, you typically have the brood nest in the middle, which is, is your, a lot, of, a lot of eggs are being laid by the queen, the larvae is um, going through its stage, the bees are feeding them, and then when about 11 days in, if they're a worker bee, they then get their capping on, and they spin a silk cocoon around themselves, and that's the bees making their babies, and that typically happens more in the center. So out towards the edges, usually the outer frame is just honey storage. So you can get in there and take some honeycomb from there. I was doing that the other day with my son who's just turned seven and taking some of the frames from the edge and cutting a big chunk of honeycomb and it was beautiful just to take it to a, uh, a dinner party we went to and say, this is Jarley's honeycomb. So that's something nice you can, you can do as well. You can also add a, an extra box just for honeycomb collection or you can uh, collect honeycomb under the roof if you take the plug out in the inner cover. You can either confine them to a small space by um, putting, say, a glass um, baking dish over the top, or you can let them just go crazy in the roof, but that's a little bit of a mess to clean up later. So I tend to uh, either just keep the cap in or um, confine them to a smaller space to do their wild honeycomb thing in the roof. Fantastic. Um, Bill's asking from Canberra, what's the best way to store the flow frames over winter and do you need to clean them before storage? So, if, if uh, it depends where you are in the world a little bit, but the very best way is you take them off and you put them in a deep freeze. Now that just keeps them as they are till next time you need them. So here we are in a subtropical region, we leave them on the hive year round. But as you say, in those colder areas, it's common for beekeepers to take uh, some or all of the honey supers off for the winter time. And if you don't have a deep freeze, then it's best to store them dry. If you store them with honey on them and your climate isn't freezing cold, then you could get mold and things building up on those frames and the, the nectar fermenting. But it really depends how cold it is in your area. Some, some places don't need a deep freeze because it's because out in the garage it's deeply frozen all winter. So um, if you don't have a freeze or it's not cold enough, then what you can do is um, harvest all the honey, let the bees lick up the last bits and store them dry just in a tub, keep them away from vermin and wax moth and things, and then they'll be ready to go back on next time you need them. Right, this is a good one. Bill's asking, what's the difference between nectar and pollen and how are they collected by the bees? So that's a great one. Let's have a look at the front of the hive here and see if we can see any pollen coming in. So bees, when they fly to the flowers, they're statically charged and they're covered in these fine hairs, even on their eyeballs. And as they approach the pollen grains actually jump off the flower onto their body and then they move all of that pollen by combing it down themselves to their hind legs and let's see if any's coming in. I just saw one come in with big yellow pollen balls on its back legs. So let's see if there's any more that's going to come in here and you can sit here and watch and see how much pollen they're bringing in. There was another one, big orange balls on the back legs there. So. A little bit hard to pick up. Some of our slow motion photography that my sister does really shows that. I can see white pollen coming in on the other side. It's pretty cool to see the different colours. Then they take that pollen, they, they uh, dislodge it from their hind leg and they push it down a cell with their head. Now, oh, a couple more nice orange pollens coming in in the centre there. Now be careful on the front side of the hive because that's where bees can get a bit territorial depending on their genetics. So, so wear your bee suit if you're, you're standing around in front of the hive and your gloves. There's one there with beautiful orange um, pollen just in front of my finger. If you bring the camera up a bit higher, you'll probably see that. Give us a thumbs up if you can see the orange pollen and the bee just in front of my finger there. There it is. Look at that. Excellent. 
So there you go, that's a pollen. But they don't eat pollen, they eat, they eat bee bread, right? And they use that to feed to their young larvae. Now, just like us, it's good to make a good sourdough. So when they're making their bread, they add their special sauce, their enzymes, and they top it with a little bit of honey and they let it ferment. And once it's soured, it's already pre-digested for them and that makes good food for their young. Now honey on the other hand, they're collecting nectar. They're, they're sucking it up, it's very liquid, and they're filling their honey stomach. So when they come back, they might have pollen and nectar loaded to the point where it's almost their entire body weight. And this little bee might have to travel four to six miles back to the hive. It's incredible that they can actually do it. And they do get tired on the way home and they'll actually tap off a little bit of nectar into their main digestive tract to keep them going on the way home. They come back and they pass that to a receiver bee by regurgitating it from their honey stomach. And then that receiver bee will start splashing it around the cell walls. And sometimes you'll come here, particularly in the evening after a day when they've been foraging, and you'll see all of this nectar being splashed around empty cells and that's them drying it out, starting that dewatering process. It's an incredible thing. So there's a bit of a rundown on nectar and pollen. Pollen gets used for bee bread, nectar gets used to make honey. That was the short answer. <laughs> nice one. Cedar, um, Michael's asking, can you stop a harvest halfway through um, a flow frame? It's best not to because um, it'll just keep flowing down, right? And it'll spill into the hive then. So what you can do if you, if you don't want this much honey, because this is quite a lot of honey, it's only one of the frames, but it's still a lot of honey, um, is just harvest part of the frame. And you do that just by putting the key in halfway and turning it, and then you would have um, just half a jar of honey. Half of one of these jars, if you're using little um, 280 ml jars, you'll have three or four of them for half a frame. You get about two litres of honey or about three kilograms of honey per frame. It does vary a bit depending on what the bees are up to on that particular frame. Now, I can see a bee has jumped in the jar. Now, this is a common question. It's like, how do you stop bees going into the jar? So you can do that pretty easily just with a bit of, bit of wax wrap. If the bees start to do that, it's good to, to not let them uh, eat that honey. I'm just going to use this key. I'm going to see if I can put that right back on the landing board. The other bees will clean it up. If I just put it here, it should fall off onto the landing board. There it is. And straight away you can see the other bees will come in and start cleaning it. So it's really not a problem to get one or two bees. You can deal with that. But if, if lots start going for the jar, then cover it up. And I'll show you how to do that just by uh, getting a wax wrap like this. It's nice and reusable. Or you can use um, some plastic kitchen wrap if you want to, whatever you have, or even your, your mesh from your veil. And it's just a case of sealing it off like that. And that's all you need to do. And bees won't get in the jar. You could then walk away and let the last remaining bits fill the jar while not having to monitor it. Any questions? Yeah, Cedar, um, Jeff is asking the, you know, how the validity of the flow frames. Um, how do they last forever and do they need any renovations or maintenance at times? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're seven years in, it's still early days really. This is my father and I's invention and we would love it to last forever and we've still got frames that are lasting the seven years but we, we don't have a flawless record. We do have um, people ringing up in our know, customer support saying this happened, that happened but please um, we will look after you if you have any problems then we will, we will uh, look after you and make sure you get going again. Now um, having said that it's only a very small percentage of people that have had any issues with their frames so if, if that happens to you just get in contact. We do want to make as long lasting product as we can. Great. Um, now this question, Cedar, what is the best way to get the bees to make a propolis envelope? I don't want to damage the flow box, but I plan to take a wire brush to the interior of a standard brew box to rough it up. Is ah, that... okay, so what um, I think you're talking about there 
is there's, there's been some great research by um, Seely and others in the world um, showing that in natural tree hollows, the interior is rough and the bees will coat it all in propolis. And that provides this antibacterial coating that has health benefits for the hive. In fact, this is propolis and beeswax. So it, it would smell a bit like this on, on, on the inside and be this nice coating. If you rough up the interior of your box, you can sometimes get the bees to do that coating on the inside of your hive and that might have health benefits for your bees. Now I've tried it and um, I didn't have great success but I, I have to admit I haven't tried it a lot. So let us know how you go with that technique and uh, I guess there's lots of different ways to rough it up. Um, some people make lots of little saw cuts so it's grooved and um, but it's but I haven't um, tried the wire brush method, so I'd be interested to know how it works for you. Great, Cedar, would a greenhouse with a skylight doors be suitable for a flow hive? So bees need to forage on a massive um, area, so as long as they can get out to the world easily, you don't want to keep them inside the greenhouse, they will run out of forage very quickly. They'll be foraging on a um, sort of two to six mile radius around here. Um, so that they, a hive like this could visit 50 million flowers in a day. Absolutely extraordinary, amazing pollinators and it's why humans have dragged them all around the world wherever they go because they've become such an important part of our pollination and our, our food chain. So they'll run out of flowers really quickly inside a greenhouse. Great. Cedar, Fred's asking, what are your tips for swarm prevention and do you have a preferred approach? Okay, I do. So come springtime, it's the natural thing for the bees to build up, get really busy. There's a lot of resources coming in, a lot of nectar and pollen, and their natural thing is to divide and half the colony will leave and start a new colony. Now that's called a swarm. So what you can do to prevent that, because you do lose half your bees at that point and your productivity drops, and if you're in suburbia, it might not be an ideal way to meet your neighbours if the swarm of bees is on their washing line or whatever. Having said that, jars of honey go a long way. Uh, so, swarm prevention in the springtime. My favourite method is to take splits. So as you see the hive building up, you take, um, take a few frames or half the frames out of this bottom box and you put them into a new one. If there's eggs on those frames they can raise their own queen, if there's not um, then uh, you need to choose at some different frames or introduce a queen from a queen breeder to that split. We've got videos at thebeekeeper.org or you'll also find videos on our YouTube and Facebook channels showing you how to take splits. And what that does is provide a whole lot of fresh real estate in the bottom box for the bees to draw new comb and for the queen to lay. And that is the primary trigger for swarming is not enough room for the bees to do their thing and raise their young. So harvesting the honey is another good one for, for in the springtime. If they've got lots of honey, make sure you're harvesting some because um, that'll keep your bees busy and that's one of the secondary swarm triggers as well. Genetics plays a big role in swarming. You'll find some bees are just ex really swarmy and others aren't. I've got a hive outside my door, we're going on five years now, hasn't swarmed. I've had other hives that swarm multiple times in a season and, and if that gets annoying, it's not suitable and you're not around to catch the swarms, then what you'll need to do is get in there and replace the queen with some known genetics from a queen breeder. They usually try to breed ultra swarmy traits out because it becomes annoying for the, for the beekeepers. Uh, other ways is you can um, do some spring management by taking some of the combs from the edge, which are typically taking them out and putting some fresh ones back in the middle and that will alleviate that congestion as well. So if you don't want to take a split, that could be something you might like to do. Eat some honeycomb from the edge and put some fresh ones back towards the centre of the brood nest. Right, so the, the, um, you were showing before the front of the hive and there was a lot of bees out the front. Is that just a normal thing, the, the bees just hanging out the front? 
during it, the day. It is. So that's a, that's a very healthy, normal hive where you've got a lot of bees there. And it's also healthy for them to build up even more than that and cover sometimes the entire front of the hive, especially on a hot day when they need to vacate a bit to get their ventilation going you'll find there'll be a massive bee beard hanging down off the landing board and bees all over the front. That is healthy as well. And when you see them really hard pack in the window in the side here where you can't even see the comb, then it's time to take a split or add another box. That's another thing you can do for swarm prevention is add another box um, and give them some more space. So, so uh, yeah, it's normal to see a lot of bees at the front. Right, Robin's asking, Sue, so do you use a feeder under the roof of the flow home? Um, not often. Around here, there's always something flowering, so our bees are fine. But people do use feeders under the roof of flow hives. You can make a really simple one just with a Ziploc bag full of sugar syrup and poke some pinholes in it. Take the cap out of the inner cover and the bees will get up there and suck through those pinholes. Uh, if, if, if there's a time when there's not enough nectar around and you really want to um, keep your bees going or perhaps the, the winter's coming and you want to build up some stores for them and they're not going to do it themselves so um, although sugar isn't the best it's still better than letting your bees starve so you feed them sugar syrup and they can store it in, in their frames and use that to stay alive during that long winter. We're in this subtropical region here and we don't really get a long winter. So we can just um, harvest pretty much um, all year round. Having said that, it ebbs and flows and uh, we do get times with no flowers as well. And that sort of flows onto this one from Glenn. Um, said he's got a few frames. He's in southeastern Melbourne here in Victoria, Australia. And a couple of them are not quite fully capped yet, but just wondering, should he harvest them before winter or leave them there for the bees over winter? Ah, uh, that's a great question. It's a debated topic whether to leave the flow frames on or off for the winter. You're in Melbourne, you could probably go either way, but if you are going to leave the flow hive on for the winter, then the, the, the flow frames on for the winter, then do take out the excluder. So if the queen um, does move, you can move freely with the rest of the bees around the hive. You don't want her left behind while the rest of the bees are, have gone up to to huddle where the honey is up the top, or she might perish and you'll start spring with no queen. So um, look, there's one more bee has come. I might need to put my, <laughs> my uh, wax wrap back on. So ask some local beekeepers about that, how much honey you'll need to store for winter in Melbourne. My sister's down there and she keeps quite a few flow hives. So maybe she'll chime in with the answer, but if you've got the answer, chime in. That's what it's all about. Right. See, the Laurel's asking, if your neighbour is a beekeeper, will the, flow, will the flow hive bees interfere with the neighbour's hive? No, you can have, as you can see, a lot of hives here um, and it's not really a problem. So there's one bee just starting to buzz around my head. So nice idea to keep, keep your veil handy and um, you can just put that on to protect yourself. Um, stings on the face aren't very much fun. And that just, um, for, for light work, you use this veil for actually doing your inspections. It's good to use your full, full bee suit or bee jacket. The question? Um, about the bees and the neighbors. Neighbors, yeah. So, so around here they tend to, commercial beekeepers will go a hundred or so in one spot um, and then a hundred in another spot just to make sure they're not maxing out the flowers in the zone. So just a few bee, beehives next door won't make much difference at all to your honey levels that are coming in. The only interference that could cause is if um, your neighbour or yourself um, hasn't been um, looking out for their bees and they die out for some reason, then you could get robbing from one hive to the other and pathogen spread. So make sure you're looking after your bees. Keep an eye out if, if, they, if the numbers are dropping. Get in there and do your brood inspections, see what's going on and get them back to being healthy and happy. 
Great. This is a question I haven't heard before from Scott. He's in Brisbane here in Queensland, Australia. Added a super a few weeks ago and added a small blob of burr comb on the outside frame to watch the bees work it. Once all the burr comb was distributed in the small area, they seem to now only be using propolis to join the cells together and not wax for the frames. Is this normal? It depends on what the bees have at their, at their ready. So if they're not getting a whole lot of nectar coming in, they won't produce that white new virgin wax. They'll actually recycle wax from around the hive, which often has a high propolis content and is quite brown. So they will quite often use the brown old wax to, to get started while they're waiting for uh, more resources to come in. And as the nectar flow picks up, they'll start using uh, virgin wax, which will be white or yellow. Right. Uh, Jose's in Kansas, USA. Just wondering um, where it gets really cold winters, and I know we get this question asked a lot. Um, would you recommend two brood boxes to, to keep their food supply full to get help them survive through the winter? Uh, you might have to ask your local beekeepers that one, and ask a couple because you ask two beekeepers and you'll get, get five answers, right? So, so it's this thing of finding out um, what people normally do, ask some other flow hive beekeepers too if there's any, anyone else that can help answer that question, that'd be great. Because I have gotten into situations where one beekeeper will swear you need two 10 frame honey supers to survive the winter. And I go around the corner and another commercial beekeeper, this is in our southernmost state, Tasmania, uh, and they're like, no, no, set up like this is fine to survive the winter. So. It, it's about just making sure you do have enough stores for the to, for your colony to last, and that knowledge will best come from your local beekeepers. Great, right, Chuck. Um, just wanting to uh, mention his queen. He's one of our ambassadors. Said he found one of his queen this morning. It's three years old because he'd marked it red, and now it's going into its fourth year. So he was pretty pleased about that one. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, my philosophy. Like, I don't need the extra 10% of production because. Um, I'm not a, a commercial beekeeper relying on the honey coming in. So if I've got a good queen and she's performing well, then I'll just leave her and let her, let her go. Whereas commercial beekeepers will typically replace their queens every couple of years because they do need a, a, a strong thriving colony really to bring in the honey. So um, yeah, that's great having, um, having a, a, a color on it. So for those that don't know, it's typical to mark queens with a paint marker just on the back of the, uh, on their thorax and it'll be a colour for each year so that then you can identify like Chuck has how old the queen is. So that's neat. Yeah, that would make it so much easier. I can never spot the queen. The <laughs> son can, he's got better eyes than me, so I think I need to paint my queen. <laughs> Cedar Charles is saying, is there a minimum distance in between hives if you're wanting to have multiple hives? There isn't. Commercial beekeepers will keep them right up against each other. It's sometimes four to a pallet, just wall to wall. Or in Europe, we've got honey houses where they're wall to wall with each other for an entire side of a building. So bees are clever. They know you do get a bit of drift. If you don't want drift from bees from one hive to the next, then you want to be 10 metres apart and then you're unlikely to get any drift, the studies show. So we have them this far apart just simply because it's a bit easier to work. If I'm here, I can stand here, pull the hive apart, and we're not running into the other hive. And also at the windows on the side, you need enough room to, to get in there and open the windows as well. And let's have a look here. We can open that window now. And you can see some beautiful capped honey there. So that frame looks nice and ready to harvest. A couple of cells still missing. Maybe next week it'll be all fully capped. So Beautiful. What, so what sort of bees uh, have we got here? So these are Italians. So there's all sorts of different breeds, but these, these lighter golden ones uh, typically Italian bees, but here from local breeders we can get Carnolian bees, Caucasian bees. Um, Caucasians are actually the dark ones, so if you get really dark black bees then they're called Caucasians. 
and then beekeepers will come up with um, different names for their own special breeds. They might call them golden Italians and, and so on. And each queen breeder will give you a bit of a, a, bit of a lowdown of what the, the great traits of their bees are. The Caucasians are supposed to go a bit further to, to find flowers. They're supposed to be a bit better at throttling the size of their colony to the nectar flow. But bees will be bees and they'll do all sorts of different things. And often they're a mix in one hive too because the queen might mate with 30 or more drones. So you've got the genetic material from a lot of hives coming in. And that's why you'll see quite a mixed bag sometimes when you look in the window, dark bees, light bees and so on. But they're all Apis mellifera, which is the European honey bees have uh, taken all around the world with them because they're such amazing pollinators. Nice. So what, how do you protect your bees from diseases and pests? Okay, so the best defence is actually keeping your hive strong. So typically, um, like something like chalk brood will take hold when the colony is weak. Uh, hive beetles will take over when the colony is weak. So it's about getting in there and if, you're, if your queen's lagging and the colony is really reducing in numbers, um, having a look and seeing whether she's laying well or not and perhaps you need a new queen to pick up the numbers or uh, perhaps there's another reason and they swarmed and you just need to, to really um, monitor your hive as they build back up again. You might put some oil in the tray down here. We have a pest management tray down the bottom of the hive which um, we just cleaned out actually. Uh, there was a lot of rain recently, there was a lot of water and muck in there so we just cleaned that out. But you can put some oil in there and hive beetles will um, come uh, through the mesh bottom as the bees chase them around and that's a nice way to um, keep the hive beetles low and you probably only need to do that when your bees are low in numbers. When you look in the side window like this hive is a bit low in numbers it's not too bad but you can see in the window there's nothing much happening upstairs here so compared to the hive next to it so this hive is a bit low even though we're seeing a lot of activity I will expect them to breed up a bit soon um, so I think they're fine but keep an eye on a hive like this and maybe start tra trapping some of those beetles when numbers are low is a great thing. Varroa, uh, something that other continents have, we don't have it here in Australia luckily. So those mites will need um, treating um, depending and there's all sorts of different strategies and theories about how to do that, how to deal with them. I'm no expert, have a look at the beekeeper.org for that or, um, or get the information from beekeepers. Um, there's also AFB and EFB, uh, two others that um, are, are a spore-producing uh, bacterium that gets into the brood, and that's a nasty one. EFB, you can nurse your colony back to back to good health with. AFB, uh, you can't. That one, it's good to keep a lookout for. Um, in case you do get it, that one you will have to destroy your colony for. So in, in most countries, some countries allow you to treat for it, but most it's a um, destroy one. So brood inspections, number one, uh, learn about your bees, get in there and check for, for pests and diseases. Monitor your entrance, look, look in the windows, just check that, that on the bee numbers, trap beetles, things like that. Um, when your hive's nice and strong, there's less to do, but you still want to get in and, and do a routine brood inspection a couple of times a year to make sure uh, your brood is looking happy and healthy and there's no signs of AFB or EFB. Have a look at the beekeeper.org uh, or um, other resources online if you want to know what they look like. It's good to get a visual on that and um, so when you are doing your brood inspections, you know what to look out for. Great, and on the, the beekeeper.org, Cedar Rhonda's asking, um, if they take the beginner bee course, would you still recommend starting a hive with a local mentor? It's up to you which way you want to learn. So um, some people like to dive in and 
they're happy learning with online material and, and books and things and other people really want to get uh, a, a mentor to come and help and both ways are fine as long as you are learning, as long as you are uh, doing your brood inspections and, and learning as you go. If you're feeling a bit nervous then great, get, get some help from a mentor or even another beginning beekeeper. Sometimes it's nice just to have somebody there with you as you uh, pull apart your bees for the first time or install your bees for the first time. But yes, if you can find a, a mentor then that's great, that'll fast track your learning and get you really um, looking after your bees. I think the first bit is critical, like if, if, you, if you get your colony and inspect them a few times as they build up, it really gives you uh, confidence to keep doing that going forward. Rather than letting your colony uh, build up really big and then it's a more daunting process to do your first brood inspection. So that when you first get your bees, do a few inspections, just get comfortable with doing that. And of course you're in your bee suit with your gloves and you've got your smoker and uh, make sure you're, you're looking after yourself. Mate, Becky's asking, um, got a big colony of bees and the hive's going really well, but every time um, she goes to do an inspection, the bees are all hitting her bee suits. And she's just wondering, is there any way to calm them down? Because she's finding it hard to um, deal with the hive and want, with what she's wanting to do with all the bees kind of going for it. Ah, uh, yes. So if you've got aggressive traits like that that make it really hard, the first thing you do is try a lot more smoke. And try on a, a warm sunny day mid-morning to mid-afternoon. If they're still really aggressive and hard to work with and you do want to change that, then it'll be a process of changing the queen. And if that's a bit daunting, then get some help to do that. It'll be a process of finding the queen, taking her away, waiting a day, and inserting a new one in a little queen cage from a queen breeder. And they will breed for nice, calm genetics. A month later, you'll have a hive with a completely different temperament. But Sue's asking, um, in Sydney, just feels like she wants to do a bit of maintenance and re-oiling on her hive, must have the western red cedar one. Just wondering the best way to do that with the bees still in the hive and what type of oil would you suggest? Okay, so you can oil hives with the bees in it. Obviously, caution there, you're in your bee suit, get your gloves and so on. And the, the sides and the back seem to be fine because there's there's no bees on, on this face here. But doing the front you might want to choose really early in the morning before the bees are very active so you can get right past where all the bees are hanging out at the front there. And you can give your hive a rub if it's if it's a bit mildewy and old looking the wood you can use something called oxygen bleach and a scrubber and give it a good scrub or you could give it a little rub with some sandpaper and then apply your oil to get it um, looking uh, like, like wood that's been looked after. Outdoors, if you're trying to keep it looking like this, then you are fighting nature a bit. Nature wants to turn it back into the earth, so it will need some TLC to keep it looking uh, like wood. Other people will just put no coating on it all and let it go grey, and that, that's something you can do as well. Um, the decking coats are the ones that last the longest. If you're after a long lasting finish, then um, yeah, I believe, ask your paint shop, but you can, you can put some of those deck coats right over the top of a previous oil. Great, we've got a few people seated. Um, obviously we're going to wait for our myth busting that we did last week about the bananas, wondering how they're going. But oh, we're, not, we're not going to look at that, are we, for a no, couple no, of no, weeks? No, a couple more weeks. Yeah, we're um, going to have to be patient on that one. That's right, wait a month, says the online material, and then we'll have a look and see whether the bananas did anything or not. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> Cedar, um, Caitlin's just wondering if you, if you harvest the honey from the flow frames and it's not completely capped, will it just mean that the honey is thinner and you can't eat it? You can certainly eat it and you should eat it quickly because if the moisture content is too high, say above that 18-20% range, then it's likely to ferment and you know a month later you might find this little bubbles forming and it's starting to get a fermenty taste to it. So if you're anything like our family, then you consume it quite quickly anyway, it's not a problem. But keep it in the fridge, it'll last longer. You could also make honey mead with it, and you can also mix it with another honey that's really thick, and then even it out. 
You can buy a thing called a refractometer where you can actually check the moisture content, make sure it's down around that 18% range, and then it will keep on the shelf for almost eternity. It's got a lid on it and it's sealed. Yeah. So the Fabian's asking, um, if you do remove the queen excluder over winter to let the queen move up into the super um, and with the colony and she starts laying eggs in the super, is that, does it impact future harvests? Uh, it doesn't actually. I've had that happen where the, perhaps the queen's gotten through the excluder when she's small and she started laying in the flow frames. Now some won't. Um, it's, it's a bit of a gamble there on genetics. And, but if you do find there's some broods gotten in the flow frame, then the thing to do is shake all the bees off the frames and put your excluder back in place and put your flow frames back on. And that way your queen will be down underneath again in the correct area for laying. And, and what you've probably identified is the, those cells where the queen has been laying and brood has emerged, there's a brown coating on them. And that's the silk cocoon of the bee, but it doesn't seem to affect it. Your, your flow frames will act as normal even after they've had the little silk cocoons. It just seems to break when the parts move. Right. Nathan's asking, he's got one thriving hive, but one thriving hive, but one of his hives seems to have a chalk brood issue. How far should he move the weaker um, nuke away so that it does not affect or infect the healthy hive? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so chalk brood is a uh, fungus and they'll get it off leaves and trees and things everywhere in, and normally your colony is well enough or the genetics are good enough to deal with it. Um, but as to you certainly don't want to start mixing up your equipment from one hive to the other or you'll put a spore load to your other hive to deal with. Um, but uh, not, I think to, to stop drift between hives, then 10 metres they say. But I'm not sure that in a chalk brood case it'll make a whole lot of difference. It's probably not as likely to get to the next hive. But um, if you've got information on that, chime in and let us know what you think about distances between a hive with chalk brood and a hive without. What I'm going to show you now is the, putting the, the frame back together and packing up your harvest. So we've just harvested. So what we need to do is put the key in the top slot. Now I need to tighten up that because that swing is moving. So this key here goes right in the top there and all the way back to your feel a knock at the back, that's it. Now I'm going to turn it to 90. And what that's done is moved all of the parts from being hexagons like that, uh, a blip, back into hexagons. And it's important to leave the key there for a minute or so, just so that all the parts move back into their correct position. Wax and propolis is sticky, and if you just do a quick close like that and then go, you might find your parts will bounce back and that'll cause problems like spillage and things later when parts aren't aligned properly and you get um, extra build up between this point here and when you harvest it might not uh, create a big enough channel for honey to flow down. So we've learnt over the years, make sure you do it a good close and you can almost feel the resistance of this. I can feel that's still got a bit of resistance there, and it should have a little bit, but you, you get a feel for, for what it feels like when it's properly closed. Okay, next um, we've got this cap, but have we got the other cap? Here you go. There we go, thanks Trace. What I'm gonna do is just take this out quickly and put this cap back in. Now, straight away there's a little point there for the remaining honey to drain back into the hive. I'm going to rest that there, that little tongue that was used to, to block that leak back point in there also acts as a nice little support so the last bit if you don't want to eat it can just drain into your jar. Good one.
Uh, time for any last questions? Yes, yeah, Cedar. Um, Chris is asking, is it okay to have a Russian hive next to an Italian hive? <laughs> um, well, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by an, a, a Russian hive, um, but it, there isn't a whole lot of issues with um, keeping the Apis mellifera honeybees, all the different strains next to each other. They'll even be a mix inside the hive. So um, perhaps post a picture or something of your, your two types of hive. It, you might be talking about a different style. This is, this is what's called a Langstroth hive and we've got our invention in it and it's um, become a flow hive but it's basically a Langstroth hive with our flow frames in it. But around the world there are different types of beekeeping. There's top bar hives, there's, uh, there's hives that um, uh, make up parts of walls where the frames come out sideways. There's a, a bee it's going, for your seat. going for me. I might just put my veil back down. There we go. Okay. Nice. Cedar, here's a good last one. What's a good surface to place your hive on? Grass, wood, pallets, dirt, and people have obviously noticed our cement blocks on these ones, which we don't normally harvest from the sapery. Yeah, so here we've just used a, what's called a hebel block, and it's a, it's a lightweight cement block. And that was just to get it up out of these weeds a little bit. Uh, but you can put it on anything as long as it's stable. So if you're on really soft soil and it starts to rain, sometimes your hive can fall over as it really starts to get heavy with honey. So putting a, a paver or something, or a block of wood under, under each leg will stop that from happening. If you've got a classic hive, then you'll need to level a surface. Where, whereas if you have these nice adjustable legs, then you won't need to go through that step of making sure your services level to start with. Nice. Got a nice jar of honey here. Yeah, got Take back to the office. Love that. It's beautiful. <laughs> Look at the colour. Oh my god. It's got these reddish tones from the heathland down here. Beautiful. Cedar, so what's the biggest problem you think beginners might have? Um, the biggest problem might be just getting started. You'll find that some beekeepers will take a while, they go on a bit of a journey of learning and at some stage they take the plunge and getting bees is, is one. So um, it can take a little while so you might want to start lining up that, that now if you're getting started. Phone around to see who's got some bees you can purchase. You, there's different ways to get started. You, you can take a split from somebody else's hive or you can order what's called a nucleus from a queen breeder or a package that comes in the mail which is like an artificial swarm. Or well, you might get lucky and catch a swarm in the springtime. But yeah, just getting, taking that plunge to get your bees and put them in is probably the first hurdle for a beginner. Nice. And Cedar, how often would you check your hives? So it it's, it varies a little bit. So here, commercial beekeepers will go through the hives at least twice a year to, to, to go through every comb, shake the bees off, check for pests and disease. Now, we go through a bit more often here because um, we're doing all sorts of things with our bees and, and, and experimenting and so on and doing lots of show and tells for pulling the hives apart and things. But um, having said that, there's probably a few colonies here that get less love than others, but it's, it's also an as-need basis. So do you book in some routine brood inspections a few times a year, one um, in, in the early spring to make sure it, it's nice and healthy and you might do your spring management, make sure there's plenty of space for the queen to lay uh, and then one later on in the season as well. So make sure you do that, those. And the rest of the time it becomes a bit more as needed. So if you notice that the bee numbers are dropping for some reason, then get in there and have a look, see what's going on. Maybe there's a chalk brood issue, or maybe your queen's gone altogether and it's queenless. And 
if you've detected that, you can get in there and fix it rather than letting the colony die out or get taken over by the beetles. So that's the best thing to do is just monitor. So I've got lots of hives at home. I've got 40 or so at home. And as I drive past, I just look at the entrances and notice when one is low on numbers and, and make sure I go back and check that one. Nice. So the Debbie and Bega here in New South Wales, um, just taken off the flow for winter because they've had so much rain and there's not much um, honey stored in it. Do, do you take the queen excluder off as well? And she's feeding them at the moment. You, um, if you're taking all the boxes off, yeah, take the queen excluder off as well. It, well. it doesn't matter either way at that point, but generally you would clean it up for the next time you put it back on. Um, if you're leaving the box on, then remove the queen excluder for, for winter so that the bees can really uh, move about freely in the hive and your queen isn't left behind under the excluder. Thank you very much for all your great questions. If you've got answers to people's questions, keep chiming in and answer those. That's what it's all about, sharing the knowledge. And if you want a, a handhold, an online course, then have a look at thebeekeeper.org. It's also a fundraiser. We're really happy to be planting a million trees this year from funds raised from thebeekeeper.org, an online course with people contributing to it, my father and I, and lots of other amazing expert beekeepers from around the world. Check that out and uh, let us know also what you'd like us to cover next week and hopefully have something interesting to show you. Thank you very much for tuning in.